Married, divorced, and single here, it's one family that mingles here. Conservative and liberal here, we've all got to give a little here. Big and small here, there's room for us all here. Doubt and believe here, we all can receive here. LGBTQ and straight here, there's no hate here. Woman and man here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, for all of us, grace here. In imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us, let us live in love without labels. About five years ago, I left church. That might not be a big deal for some of you. It happens all the time. People leave church, especially nowadays when so many Christian churches are aligning with values far different than what many of us find not only in our scripture, but also what we know in the person of Jesus Christ. But I left church. I could not reconcile what I was discovering to be true in my own life and what I was experiencing within the walls of the building. There was too much inconsistency, there was too much cognitive dissonance, and there was too much pain, and I had to leave to spare my own faith in a God that I knew that loved me beyond more than anything I could ever imagine. And that wasn't what I was experiencing at church. In the big scheme of things, I really wasn't gone for long, but I did have to leave. I had to go through the pain, I had to go through the loss, I had to go through the grief, and I had to discover that God's love for me did not hinge upon my church attendance or my church involvement. It's a hard thing when we finally identify our fear, and I thought back then that my church attendance was a condition of God's love for me. I learned through the process, though, that God's love is completely independent of anything I'll ever do and completely dependent on who I am, a child of God made in God's image. And what I discovered in this church hiatus is that I wasn't really done with church. I wanted to be. I didn't really want to need church. Sure, I really did miss some aspects. I missed the insurance policy of a casserole in case we came upon some hard times. I missed the knowledge that people knew me and they knew my family. A place I missed of mutual benevolence where we could serve together the least of these. But I also knew there were a lot of people who could not belong as I belonged. As a straight, white, cisgender, married mother who professed Christianity. I'm sure many of you have found yourselves in the midst of a church shopping experience. It's sometimes interesting and most times awful. But for many of us, there comes a moment when we just know that we're in the right spot. A few years back in the midst of my church hiatus, my dear friend's daughter was very sick and she was admitted into Children's Hospital. There were moments in her week-long stay where her parents questioned if she was going to make it. And as a mother, I recognize that this is one of those moments where everything is made clear. The only thing a mother, the only thing a parent wants is for their child to get better. And any parent would trade places in a heartbeat if that meant their child could have relief from their suffering. I went down to Aurora one day to see them. And for us bystanders, these situations can render us feeling a little helpless. And it's all I had to offer, my presence, my tender love, my support, and a hug. I got there, and after a cracking a few terrible jokes, which is something I do in the face of potential tragedy, just to let you know, I took my friend downstairs for some lunch. The meal, it was not memorable, and we ate quick, anxious to get back upstairs. The hospital was unfortunately bustling, so the elevator seemed to stop at every floor. And at one point, a group of about six or so young professionals stepped on. We, the both of us, pressed up against the edge of the elevator, staring forward and up, as we all do. And then they all got off, except for one. And then it was just the three of us. The woman who was left, she asked us why we were there. And my friend, she gave a quick rundown about her daughter. And then I asked, so what's your job? She said, I'm a chaplain. And at that moment, 
in these desperate questions, clinging to hope, I inhaled audibly. My body knew before anything else registered up here that this is the only thing that works. God is the only thing that works. Community is the only thing that works. And the relief that I felt, it was immediate and it was telling. A few weeks later, after this experience, for some reason, I was sharing this story with my therapist. And after I had shared my story, we went on to other things, and then I moved into my church issues, and I was distraught. I was outlining for her my painful struggle of leaving church and not knowing where to go, and I was truly in the wilderness. After visiting a few churches in the county, nothing felt right. They all felt like way too much work. And so I was anxious and I was frightened that we would never find a church home again. And I was also anxious and frightened that maybe I would never return. My therapist then said, remember that feeling that you had in the elevator at the hospital? Remember how your body responded? Could it be possible that your body will feel the same way when you step into the right church? And sure enough, she was right. A couple months later, we found Highlands Church in Denver, the church that would ultimately help us start this church, Left Hand Church. The moment I stepped through their, their doors, I knew. I knew from here, not from here. This palpable relief, this palpable relief is ours. As followers of Christ, as people who live according to the gospel of Jesus, we get to discover this same relief. The book of Ephesians reminds us that we are loved, that we are desired by a God who delights in us. And as the church, we have a generous responsibility to be this for one another. It is believed that the Ephesian letters were written not just to a single church, but as many of Paul's letters were, but they were written to a number of churches in the region. It's not 100% certain who wrote these letters. It's quite possible that Paul wrote them around 60 AD while imprisoned, or there's another idea floating around that it was a disciple of Paul's who wrote them after Paul's death around 80 to 100 AD. Either way, it was an important message. It was important that the message be relayed to these Ephesian churches of God's love and God's desire for the inclusion of all believers that the church as the body of Christ is where we all get to live out our greatest calling, to love God, to love others as we love ourselves. Paul is making the case that the early church in Ephesus is not just for the Jewish Christians. The early church was for everyone, including the Gentiles. In Paul, he has strong words. Let's begin in chapter 3 of Ephesians, verse 1. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, for surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I wrote above in a few words a reading, of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not not made known to to humankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, in other words, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power, Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. The vision Paul has for this early church is that everyone gets to receive these promises in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Everyone is entitled to love, and everyone is entitled to belonging. 
But when I really get honest with myself about why I left church, it's because church felt like it was for some and not for all. There were clear lines of who could lead, who could fully participate, who could use their gifts, who could access their desires. The church I was attending had strict rules around these things, rules that were not necessarily made clear. We all knew that some were in and some were not. And generally, those rules fall negatively upon the most marginalized. We all need to belong. We all deserve belonging. It is in our DNA, this need to belong. And as believers, this is our responsibility to create belonging. Paul knows that everyone gets to belong. Everyone's in and nobody's out. And the common belief that the Jewish people were the only recipients of the promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ did not fly anymore. It wasn't going to work. If I, if I, Paul, if I have to go to prison, I will gladly. But now, friends, is the time where we don't have any insiders or outsiders. We all belong. We are all, every single one of us, it does not matter, skin color, religion, socioeconomic status, health, ability, gender, documentation, none of it matters when it comes to our entitlement to belonging. All of us belong. And if church is a reflection, albeit imperfect, of the belonging that is ours in the kingdom of God, we have a great responsibility. This past week, I attended a community-wide conversation with Dr. Bruce Perry, a neuroscientist and researcher who studies trauma and how it shapes our brains, particularly the brains of children. He discussed the importance of community in impacting this trauma. Vance Brand Auditorium at Skyline High School was packed full of professionals, teachers, parents, and people who just want to get it right. It felt really special to be part of this event in our very own community. There's a lot of pain everywhere, and much of it is the result of trauma. And we're all touched by trauma every day, many of us in multiple, at multiple times, and a lot of us live with it in our bodies. And trauma is real. And our churches need to take a leading role in talking about it because it's real here just as much as it is anywhere else. Dr. Perry outlined the research and he boiled it all down. Our brains, our children's brains, for healthy functioning, it boils down to connection. All of it boils down to belonging. Physiologically, we are wired to belong. He said, and I quote, your history of connectedness is a better predictor of your health than your history of adversity. Belonging makes us healthy, not just emotionally, but right down to the wiring of our brains, which in turn translates into healthier communities, and I think we'll all agree we could use some of that right now. His research told us what we already know, tells us what, we already, what Paul already knew way back then in that infant church. We're all good. We all get to belong. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of love, is about belonging. And as a church partnered with other churches in Longmont and Boulder County, we get to contribute to the betterment of our community. And as teachers, as medical professionals, as counselors, as citizens, as parents, as Starbucks baristas, as restaurant servers, as hair people doers, <laughs> sorry, Christy, as neighbors, our work is to see. It's to see one another. Two weeks ago, Jim Moulton, a beloved teacher in our community, passed. Chris Gaddis from our church was particularly close to him and was with him during his massive heart attack at the YMCA. While I did not know Jim, I know a multitude of people, including students, who were deeply impacted not by his death, of course, that's very hard, but by his life. I talked to Katie, Chris's partner at church last week, and I asked how Jim's celebration of life service went and how they were all holding up. And she said something that I won't soon forget. It's a reminder that I really needed that day and I will cling to it. She said, you know, we all get caught up in doing big things, but Jim, he was all about the little things. 
Just seeing somebody, just loving somebody makes such a massive difference. Jim belonged, and he extended that same belonging to the people in his world, no matter where it was. And this gets to be our job. We all know that love is hard work. We talk about that here. Loving God and loving our neighbors, sometimes that just feels like way too much. But that work of loving ourselves, that can be the hardest part. But it is everything, and it makes all the difference in our own belonging. Because if we don't know that we belong, how do we extend that belonging to another? Paul knows the importance of this as his letters continue to outline the case for the inclusion of the Gentiles. And I love Rachel Held Evans' quote. I said it two weeks ago. This is what God's kingdom is like. A bunch of outcasts and oddballs gathered at a table, not because they are rich or worthy or good, but because they are hungry. Because they said yes. And there's always room for more. Each and every one of us belong at that very wide, long, generous table. And once we recognize that we belong, we get to then include other people. There's always room for more because that's what the expansiveness of God's love looks like. Paul continues in his letter, Ephesians 3.14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. This work, this work is a process there's no room for shame or condemnation. This work, it's important for us to honor our call through being strengthened in the Spirit and through the Spirit. And then we have Christ, the gospel of love living within our bodies, in our hearts, so that we can love, so that we can know that we belong and that others belong too. We are rooted and grounded in love. I'm a recovering perfectionist. I didn't used to have much kindness for myself. I think this is the plight of many, if not most humans, particularly women. It's easy for me to read these passages in Ephesians and believe that I have to arrive at some destination. But no, I get to be in process. I get to practice belief. I get to practice trust that I too am rooted and grounded in love. And once we are rooted and grounded in love, remembering how incredibly loved we are, from here is where we get to do the work. The ground and the roots, they sustain the tree, and from here is where all those little annoying tree sprouts begin. Each year in our yard, and I will take some credit here, but I shouldn't because it's all Eric. Each year, we're surprised by a new tree in our yard. They just sprout up, and they turn into a big mess. In fact, they're such a mess, I don't even notice them, but Eric seems to. And then after a couple years of the annoying mess, he, like, chops and does things. And then we actually have trees that grow in our yard. I guess it's a surprise because I'm from Southern California. And it's always a welcome surprise. And we, too, we are welcome surprises. When we are rooted and grounded in love, we form a movement of beauty and relief and color. And we join with others in this movement as we are all rooted and grounded. And before we know it, we've got something. We're not alone. We belong together. We then get to operate out of resurrection, life after death. Being rooted and grounded in the expansion of love means that we also have to root out our fears. Our biases, our stereotypes, our racism and misogyny, our homophobia and xenophobia. When we root out our fears, we then too are rooted and grounded in the work of gospel, the gospel of Jesus, the work of connection and belonging through love. 1 John chapter 4 reminds us there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, and whoever fears cannot be made perfect in love. 
And as we root out our fear, we discover that there is plenty of room for everybody at the table. And I bet that's what Paul is trying to get across. The Jewish Christians, they weren't the only ones to receive this promise. The death and the resurrection of Jesus opened wide the doors and invited everyone, even the Gentiles, to the table, where it all starts with love. Verse 18, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. What revolutionary words that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. You, me, all of us filled to the fullness of God. All of us, we're so desperately loved. And what do we do in response to that love? We're filled and we go and we see and we build and we create connection and we create belonging because our world is dying for it. I love the work that the Recovery Cafe is doing in the basement of this building. I saw one of my friends who works there at Dr. Perry's talk and I said to her, I was thinking about you throughout that whole talk because everything the Recovery Cafe is about is connection. And they like to say down there, what's the opposite of addiction? Connection. We belong. I left church because I knew not everyone belonged. I knew only some people could be in and live out their call and their gifts and their desires, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I wanted a place where I could belong and fully be me. I wanted a place where my LGBTQ plus siblings could belong and fully be them in all the fullness of God fully known, fully seen, and fully loved. I wonder if we fully grasped how loved we are, is it possible we wouldn't need to be afraid of others? Is it possible we could live in full and complete abundance knowing that there is plenty? Paul continues into chapter 4, and I'm going to read this from the message. In light of all this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. Hold on, better wait, better yet, run. On the road, God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily, pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences, and quick at mending fences. You were all called to travel on the same path in the same direction, so stay together both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. Friends, we are one, and when we're one, we work together we sit at the table together and we eat and we feast and we remember that we're loved and that we belong. And when we've had our fill, when we're satisfied, easier some days than others, we pull up a chair and we look around the room. We check the doors and we grab that person that's standing over there and we motion them over. And we say, hey, come sit next to me. I have a plate for you. Do you want me to fill it or do you want to fill it yourself? Rooted and grounded in love, we belong, and we invite others to join us in this work. And we feast, and as we celebrate our own belonging, we find others who are dying to belong. This is the community that I want, and I can make a bet that this is the community you want to. Thanks again for watching today's sermon at Left Hand Church. If you live in Colorado and would like to attend, we meet on Saturdays at 5 o'clock. If you'd like to contribute to Left Hand Church, go to lefthandchurch.org give. And if you'd like to send us a confidential prayer request, you can send it to prayer at lefthandchurch.org. Thanks again for watching.